Collision Network. T Journal presents Color Us Black. This is that power business going to cause the Negro to lose a whole lot of things for the United States government and the Howard University also. Because this one sleeping in that school, it's a disgrace not only for the university, but it's a disgrace to the community, the people around. Stop poor Robert Carmichael and Rat Brown and all that bunch. They're going to cut your own throat. You cannot go to the United States government. Now, if you think you're going to do it, you're going to get some hate crack. They're, they're holding you off because they don't know what bloodshed. With a wine. I'm telling you, brother, if Come you on, don't man. get out, you're going to get your heads cracked. Brother, I'm not against the white man. I'm not against the... the but the average colored man is a city of the soul. I'm against you. No. This is what you're fighting for, brother. Now, I'm not fighting for no black power. You're Uncle Tom. Well, I'm going to be Uncle Tom yeah, if that's the case. I'd rather be Uncle Tom. Wednesday, March 20th, 1968. Rebellious students at Howard University have taken it over, closing down what for more than a century has been the capstone of Negro education. in America. That's, that, that is the white problem here. We're not in America. And the educational system at Howard tells us we are in America. They put us in an inferior position in mind so that when it comes time to go out, we've already assumed our inferior position. They have us sort of bent so that when time comes to shove us into the system, they're going to shove us. They always tell us, well, you got... You have to be like white people. You have to do this because you're going to be competing with white people. Oh, Omega. Oh, oh, Omega. Oh, 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 there is campus on fire. Christian General Oliver Otis Howard. After gallant service in the Civil War, he was given broad powers to educate the emancipated slaves. He went on from there to pacify the hostile Indians of the West. He left behind an enduring foundation. For generations, Howard University, largely subsidized by the federal government, sent into the mainstream of American life, Negro teachers, doctors, lawyers, engineers, architects. Its contribution to the Negro middle class can hardly be calculated. Graduates from its law school occupy positions ranging up to and including Supreme Court. Most of the legal battles for civil rights were fought by Howard teachers and alumni. But among many of the 9,000 students at Howard, as with those at other Negro schools, there has been a growing disenchantment with this traditional function, a struggle for self-identity outside the American mainstream. Torn between yesterday and tomorrow, Howard has been spared the often bloody convulsions of other Negro universities. But a peaceful demonstration by 39 students in early 1968 resulted in disciplinary action against all involved. One of the rebels, the president of the freshman class, Michael Harris, 18 years old. This is a report on that rebellion. Negro and Howard, it's a figment 
of the white man's imagination. We're all, it's like we're playing a part, a role. It was founded by white missionaries. We're so, and, you know, so religiously motivated with their puritanism. They're going to come and save all the little dirty black slaves and educate them. Baptist, Methodist ministers with, with, this, with this puritanical idea, you know. And every cheer we have is a, a hymn. Rock my soul in the bosom of Howard and all this stuff. We don't need that. That was, that was back then, you know. Reaction to the probable expulsion of the 39 demonstrators was immediate. Some 1,000 students seized control of the administration building. Their demands, that disciplining of their leaders be left to a student committee, that all top administration officials resign, that Howard be given greater relevance to black America. The administration replied by closing down the university. The administration has to realize sooner or later before they die, you know, they made a mistake. They've been white men's niggas all their lives. They're not only hindering us and hurting us, they're hurting a whole lot of people, masses of people. They're hurting unborn black babies because they're, they're content to shuffle. And they say, I shuffled, I bent, I kissed some feet, you know, I made it. You do the same thing, boy, and you'll make it. We may make you dean of the college if you go to Harvard, you know. Or we may make you uh, head of this department if you learn how to be irrelevant. You know, these people around here are all powerful to be impotent and resolved to be irresolute on everything. The president of Howard, James M. Neighbor Jr., long active in the civil rights struggle, but now 68 years old, and one of the principal targets of student protest. Howard University has witnessed in these hundred years all of the struggles and difficulties which have confronted the Negro people. I think Howard University has, uh, by its very existence, by its support from the federal government, has kept alive in the government itself and in the country a definite, specific interest in the improvement of the quality of education and hence of life and opportunity of the Negro. Chapel. Here the conflict between the past and the future is joined. Guest speaker, the Reverend Wyatt Walker. We need to try that we've not we need to try to find out who we are. It's not altogether our fault that we don't, because we've suffered historical genocide at the hands of the Western historian. But not very much about black people in the history books that are used in the public education system. And so we've been robbed of a sense of heritage. It is our need, deep-seated need, to find an identity which was taken from us. And I don't have very much hope that in the next generation that your children will be uh, ha any better off than we were. They'll be brainwashed in the same way, teaching them over and over again that we live in a racist society. And I submit to you that if we're going to survive, then we've got to see to it that our children, our young people, know who they are. Because when a black person looks at himself in the context of America, this is what he has to decide. Who am I? And when he finds out who he is, then he knows what he has to do. And we want Howard to show us who we are, or to show the people who come here who they are. You know, if they have to close down this university, and, and, and they can, they do have the power. And if they have to close it down, and stop it from working, well, that's good, rather than to keep on and continue poisoning, poisoning these youths' minds and making just imitation white people out of them. One, and one, stop. Like that, and.
28 years, sociologist E. Franklin Frazier taught and wrote at Howard University. His book, The Black Bourgeoisie, is a lasting source of self-reappraisal for the black middle class, the widow of E. Franklin Frazier. I don't know what the students mean by being forced into a white image. Because um, you've got to conform to the society in which you live. You've got to live within it or outside of it. You can't straddle a fence. Now, are you going to live outside of the American culture? Or are you going to live within it? As long as you stay in America, you've got to conform. What else can you do? All the bourgeois students that I know who have gone to Howard went there bourgeois. And maybe Howard didn't make a, have a concentrated program to, to un-bourgeois them, if you want to say that. But they went there from the bourgeois Negro middle class. Howard had nothing to do with that. Now, the women of Alpha Kappa Alpha I'd like to demonstrate a modern dance that incorporates several exercises. sorority conducts its weekly charm school for children from the Washington ghetto. For Mike Harris, among others, it is a question of relevance. Won't you stop now and check out the birth? We're okay now. They live in a world of their own, a little world of Greek gods and fantasy, and all of them live there. You know, they, when they talk, they're, they're Greek orientated, the school is Greek orientated, and they, um, they, they, they like being on Mount Olympus, and you can't communicate with them. You know, they come down to the mortals when they want to, throw a blessing here and a curse there. How can you fix your foot and go away? Wash your stop now and check out the birth we're The only way now. Survey they play. Your legs and arms now. One, two, ready, start. Up, bend, hold, bounce, hold, up, back. You can't try to be someone else. You first have to be yourself. So I came to Howard thinking that it was a black university. There'll be black students here trying to find themselves and then trying to relate what they found the situation of their people. And um, in a way, it sort of disillusioned me because I came here and I found that the majority of the students really didn't even know or understand the plight of their own selves. They were, they were sort of detached from it. building. If Howard University persuades the federal government 
to serve an injunction against us, many of us will stay in the administration building and be arrested. We are supposed to be the ladies of Howard, and they want us to portray this woman on a pedestal who's trying to compete with the white man's woman. And number one, we can't do it because we do not look like the white women. And I don't think we can try and act like them either. The black administration, our black administration, seem to think that they are making a great example. They're showing the great white father how good we are. And the great white father is over there laughing at how stupid we are. Our administration is involved in some sort of fairy tale. They, the black woman has been under a lot of stress and strain through the past century or two. And because of this, she doesn't need to be put on a pedestal. She knows she's a woman. She doesn't have to be told she's a woman like our psychologically weak uh, white sisters. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, she, because she suffered, she knows the stuff she's made of, and she knows that stuff composes womanhood. They say that the black woman has dominated. Well, she has to an extent, but because she had to. But all while she was dominating, she was in the gutter. So I don't think that it was free, because any time you have to lay with a white man to feed your family, you're not free. That's the white man's concept of freedom, his freedom, not yours. We have been taught for so long to be separate. They brought the slaves over, they took mama to Virginia, father to Georgia, and the children to Tennessee. The white man taught the black man how to desert his children. White man would come in, not only would he desert his children, his children that he had by that slave woman, he would sell. They want you to be white orientated and then somewhere in the back of your mind, if you just feel like it, you can store a little bit of black knowledge and black pride. You're supposed to be proud of George Washington because he never told a lie, which in itself is a lie. Uh, the administration of Howard University, the present administration, are the children of last generation. We're the men and the women of this generation and the generations to come. Either they'll come with us or be left behind. Most likely they'll be left behind. Samuel Proctor, former president of three predominantly Negro colleges and currently director of the Institute for Services to Education. Uh, I think every administrator who's 40 years old or older uh, has some notion of where the Negro girl stands uh, on the totem pole in American society. Uh, she has uh, very few things going for her in terms of, uh, of defending her womanhood, uh, uh, defending her chastity, uh, defending her personhood. Uh, she is going to be uh, abused unless someone runs interference for her in the society. So I think that the men of these college presidents go to sleep every night with this care, this concern on their minds. There's nothing is as strong as an idea whose time has come, and there's nothing as weak as an idea whose time has passed. And their time has passed, and our time is here. That's the same attitude we go out into the community with, that we are really, well, I consider myself a moderate on this campus insofar as that I'm still willing to talk to the man and that I know people who won't talk and who, who will wait and who will plan and who will move and I can't stop them. I wouldn't even try to stop them. I'd be with them. And the same way out there, they talk about Carmichael being a, a, a radical and, you know, a hate monger. He's making the last peaceful attempt in this country to bring it around. Stokely Carmichael and H. Rep. Brown, all these men are making the last peaceful attempt. Black power is the last peaceful attempt. After that, after they refuse to see that, there's not going to be anything left. Because they may say, we can, you know, they build all these machines, these monster machines that are going to come in and wipe out things. We will wipe out the country. I know this. It will be wiped out. If they move on us, we're going to have to move on them. And we are in the cities, in the core of the cities, and we'll simply... You know, we reach the point where we'll say, like Patrick Henry, liberty or death, and then we'll move. Because we'll figure if you have to live a slave, you might as well die to be free, you know. Why die for someone else's dreams? Live for your own. Dr. 
Dr. Nathan Hare, Ph.D., author of, among other works, The Black Anglo-Saxon, former associate professor of sociology at Howard University. Following his participation in an anti-draft demonstration at Howard, he was fired. At the age of 34, he now returns to the work that helped give him his education, professional boxing. So I uh, have only two skills on which I can profess to make a living, uh, teaching and fighting, and they stopped me from teaching, having first, a few years ago, stopped me from fighting on the side. If I can't teach, then I have to fight. And I suppose it shows to uh, the students uh, that a man doesn't have to uh, fall in line with the uh, rigid kinds of uh, impossible and often unfair demands that society places on them. It seems to me that a man has a choice as he goes through life of either making his history, or helping to make his history, or having his history made for him. But in uh, life, as I experienced at Howard, uh, they uh, strike you down many ways and then pretend that they have not uh, done it. So I suppose that in a way I'm fighting back, even though uh, I haven't come so far as to imagine neighbors as the punching bag that I uh, get in the gym. in the first round, Nathan Hare. University class of 65, author of the widely acclaimed Man-Child in the Promised Land, with NET reporter Lou Potter, Howard University, class of 59. For a long time, I was more than proud to be identified with the institution. But now, you know, I, I, I prefer to be in Mississippi than near Howard University. Students and faculty members alike you know, are being emotionally and psychologically bludgeoned in the silence, man. It's like the, the, the black press in this country. <clears throat> they don't want to bother with anybody who hasn't been accepted, first of all, by the white press. Howard University is the same thing. If, if, if white America had said, black power is the thing, old natural, the old natural bag is the thing, let's get into it, Howard University would have said it's the thing, too. And all the guys who were, who were dismissed from the university are students, faculty members, guys and girls, everybody. It's like they would have been heroes on campus, but these people don't really think. They haven't yet learned to think at Howard University. They don't want to. As a matter of fact, they want to stop all the students from thinking. It seems to me that all they're about to accomplish in this time and era is 
the education man, you yeah? know? And more important than that, they are oblivious to what the needs of the, of the Negro society is today. And this is something, if they're going to accomplish anything here, that they will have to be intensely aware of, more so than anybody else in any other institution in the country. And if they're not, they might as well burn Howard University to the ground and plant cotton. At least it'll have some economic value. This generation uh, that's under 30 has a style that's very different from, from our style. We are more formal in our approaches. Uh, we are much concerned about structure and protocol. And uh, this generation uh, is cool. It's, uh, it's not impressed with these kinds of structures and uh, these kinds of formalities. And so this causes a communication gap to exist that I find to be very formidable uh, indeed. There are very few college administrators who know how to get right down with the kids understand their idiom, understand their jargon, and, uh, and make common cause with them. The students in no way feel connected in any way with the faculty, the administration, or the university. It's like they feel they're isolated little group. They're here, and that no matter what they say, regardless of it, that no one's going to listen to them. But this is nothing new. There's always gaps between generations. But all of us, are, I think, as you put it, are uh, close together in our wanting to be able to do everything that everybody else in this country can do without any dis, uh, distinctions based on economics or on color or on race or religion or anything else. And this is uh, uh, the tie that binds us. And it will bind us so long as the mass of Negroes in this country are in the poor position that they are in now. And they are in a worse position in 1968 than they were in 1960. Each day it surprised me more and more because I always find something that I didn't know existed before. You know, like I heard, um, we're talking to a professor, he told me that Negroes didn't have a culture, you know, so we didn't have a heritage. And then I find people living in Drew Hall who don't know <laughs> who, Drew, who uh, Charles Drew was. We are too critical of youth. I think they've got to find their way. They're going to make mistakes. All people do, all people have. And I don't suppose there's ever been one older generation that didn't feel that the younger generation was going to adults. And I think we have that now. Youth revolution against age, which is normal. When we get out into the world, uh, it would be awful to get out there and we don't know how to act like Negroes. Right, right because you all think? of us have the same hang-ups that most middle-class white kids have. We have to even learn how to act like Negroes. Right. Cool. But the fact is that Howard has the one resource of black talent. Black right. students only are, our whole department is almost all black. And we don't, right. and we don't, use, don't use, use it, we don't utilize it in the, right. in the classes. We don't utilize it in the, the shows we put on. We don't utilize it in any way possible. Howard is not reflecting the black man today at all, you know. You know, you reflect what's going on. Yeah. True, I mean, um, okay, maybe people don't reflect Leroy Jones as a, as a Shakespeare, as a genius, but Leroy Jones has something to say. He's a black playwright and he has something to say. And it might be angry, it might be uh, maybe uh, a little repulsive sometimes, but let's face it, we live in kind of an angry time and, and things are ugly. And, I think it needs to be shown up, and where else can you show it but in the theater? Ben says on stage to uh, Claire that he's afraid. Well, I'm afraid, too. I'm here to learn how to be a professional, and I haven't seen one thing in the drama department that's going to teach me how to be a dirt sweeper in the street. I, uh, when I first got here, I uh, said to one of uh, my professors, uh, Sir, I, I know I'm not in your... Uh, lighting class, and I, yeah. I, I, I'm not in your sound class, et cetera, et cetera. But I am interested. Yeah. I, I, I want to know how to do things. I, I want to know now. You have time now, and I have time now. Please teach me, sir. It was a, a, a pleading on this my part. Yeah. And he said with great pride, you must wait until you get to my lighting class yeah. and to my sound yeah. class to learn how to work these things. Yeah. We must take step by step, by step. The very end. And one step at a time today isn't fast enough for Howard students. 
Ben Land, drama major, was asked by NET to create a film which expresses his world and what it means to him. His theme, black self-awareness. NET will supply only the technical facilities. The document is his, that of a 20-year-old black student in America today. That question will be never answered in the film. And this is going to be done in the scene, the final scene, the bedroom scene, <coughs> in her apartment. Cut, <coughs> hard cut, you're sitting on the bed. Cut, you're up uh, by the window looking out. You're cutting back to her. Maybe after about a minute of silence, she says, <coughs> out of the clear blue, uh, you know, I've changed too, you know. Outside of the, the uh, political aspects, you know, what, what relationship a man realizes, you know, that he is involved with uh, in terms of society. He always comes back to the, to the man-woman. Well, first of all, you know, from birth, man, it's taboo to even lay sight on a white girl, you know? Yeah. And then this internal thing, man, blossoms to the point where just the, just the mere thought of going, running your hands across her flesh, man, would really send you into a frizzy, you know? I find a, a lot of uh, new black cats talking about how, how the white man has done them so wrong. And then they walk off the bandstand with a white chick. Yeah, well, you're going to always have those uh -huh. box revolutionists and these, these bedroom night writers, you know. <laughs> they uh, preach, uh, preach black nationalism. They, they preach the revamping of the system. And yet, when it all goes down, you when know. When it goes down to the sex level. Yeah. The, the, like, the two major, you know, two sections of the head. And that's supposed to be, a, that's that's supposed to be the thing, cool, you know, right? for tomorrow's future. It's like, you know, the only freedom we're going to ever uh, really have, man, is for this black cat to, you know, ride off into the sunset with this white girl. And, you know. Vice versa. You still got the one that says, man, I just can't bring myself about not digging that fat white meat. All right, look, let me explain to you what I have. This is going to be a very segmented scene. This is just what I want to happen. Try to visualize this in your mind. You're walking down the path. We just did the shot, thing we just shot. Yeah. You're walking down the path, you're going, you're talking, uh, you know, it's nice, you know, what about the weather, <laughs> you know, everything we'll be talking about. Okay, you're talking about, and you're saying, uh, you're saying, uh, I hope it wasn't on the counter of me. Then we dissolve into another scene where you're sitting over there. We dissolve right in there. We dissolve right into you sitting down. She says, I want to explain. I, I feel I should explain. I don't know. And you say, there's no need to explain. Dissolve. You're walking. Sorry, you're walking here. Sorry, good. Great, great. Okay. Look, in this point, look, I'm serious. Come on, you got to go around. Come on, when they get together, you got to go around. Can you do it? Oh, yeah.